The American West is one of the all-time great road trips showing you stuff that you would never see from up in the skies. And as you drive it along, you're watching a region change gradually, mile after mile. Truly a tra travel photography just smorgasbord, one of the great feasts of our time. I recently did nine states in 30 days. I put the highlights here together. So sit back and let's go on the road. All right, here we go. 3,300 miles down the road. Where? Ah, yes, thank you. Prescott's a northern Arizona town near Sedona and Flagstaff. It was once the capital of the state and a meeting ground for miners, gold diggers, and cowboys. Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, Big Nose Kate, they all hung out at the Palace Saloon in what's now called Whiskey Row, a downtown collection of saloons that takes up an entire city block. Prescott also has some amazing natural beauty on the outskirts of town, as I discovered with my friends Lori and Roy. This is Whiskey Row, so one in Rome, there's 167 kinds of whiskey here. Yeah, now even if you don't drink, you'll still want to make Whiskey Row your first stop in Prescott, which was the original Arizona capital circa 1864. This is the heart of the historic downtown with Old West saloons, western shops, galleries, and restaurants. The saloons themselves harken back to the Gold Rush era, and they look like they haven't changed since. Prescott, which was named for a man named Prescott, not Prescott, is a great town for travel photography and seeing an America that for many of us has simply vanished. And if you had to pick three photographs uh, that would symbolize Prescott, what would it be? Uh, Watson Lake, Whiskey Row, and Thumb Butte. Now, let's begin in Watson Lake, which is a 10-minute drive from downtown. The best time to photograph them? Now. This yeah. evening, in the evening, why? For best light, less wind, less people. Now look, in the morning, the Dells are in the shade. See the difference between morning and late afternoon? The Thumb Butte that our friend Dee mentioned is impossible to miss. It's visible everywhere in town. And like Watson Lake, is also a popular hiking spot. Now back to downtown, you are looking at several blocks of retail around the town square, which is where you will find the old courthouse building circa 1916. It's a stunner, but boo hiss. There is a no photography rule inside. Luckily, outside is fair game. Christmas, Christmas, because every one of those trees that you see in Gorgos, they just decorate them with all sorts of Christmas spellers. Beyond the square, Prescott is chock full of great old buildings dating way back. Photo tip, shoot wide. Zoom in on the details. You know the drill, you know what I say. Shoot at every angle. And when you see something that catches your eye, go for it. I fell in love with this fabulous 1940s motor cord on the side of the road, like who wouldn't? You don't see places like this anymore. So I shot lots and I kept moving. Go for the multiple angles and don't quit. Better to get more than you need than to arrive home bummed that you didn't take enough. If you're lucky enough to be in Prescott around the 4th of July, well, don't forget to check out what's called the world's oldest rodeo. It started in 1888 and it's been going strong ever since. From Prescott, we headed next to Monument Valley and stopped in Flagstaff, home to the Galaxy Diner and, for my money, the best chocolate milkshake anywhere. Two hours later, we crossed from Arizona to the Utah border, sort of. Monument Valley Tribal Park, which is part of the Navajo Nation, borders both states. So once we entered Utah, we headed right back into Arizona. You'll notice the landscape looks very different here from Prescott. 
This is the quintessential American West as discovered by the director John Ford in the 1930s, and it hasn't changed since. The view is what the West means to so many people around the world. Now take a look and then close your eyes. And I think you could imagine John Wayne riding his stagecoach right in front of those buttes, or Marnie McFly landing his DeLorean right there from Back to the Future 3 as well. Photo walk wise, it's really all about those three majestic rock formations that everybody wants to see in photographs. So it should be pretty simple. Just drive into the tribal park, step onto the viewing platform for your shot, or walk or drive down into the 17 mile loop and get up close and personal with them. But no, it's not that simple. The prime time to explore is very early in the morning to watch the sun rise over the buttes, but tribal officials will not let you down there until several hours after sunrise. That is, unless you spring for the official tour. Now we did just that, and please stay tuned because we're gonna take you on that ride with us in a minute. I filmed this episode in Monument Valley with mobile phones and iPhone and Galaxy, and I had no trouble getting great shots. Now, photo tips, you wanna do your photography early because that's when the mitts get their color. By midday, they're in the shade, and you're not gonna get a sunset over them as the sun is setting on the other side. If you're a fan of time-lapse photography like I am, this is a fantastic place to do it because who doesn't like to see the shadows formed by the sun move along as the day continues? For more on how to do time-lapse photography, check out my time-lapse video right here on this channel. Beyond gazing at the mitts, you will definitely want to jump into the car and take a drive down the road to Goulding's Resort, which has a market, a restaurant, and a wonderful museum that showcases the history of the movies made in Monument Valley. From there, get back in the car again and get ready for your big photo op number two. And this is a big highlight. A 20-minute drive northeast to what's known as Forest Gump Hill. This is an official marker where the classic 1993 movie showcased by having the lead character finally stop his marathon run. And to this day, all these years later, people are still lining up to pose in the middle of the road and act really silly, and why not? Let's face it. This is one of the greatest road shots in the world. Now, let's go on to the photo tour and say hello to our guide, Will Cowboy, who we met at the nice early morning hour of 5 10. So I got the West Mitten, the East Mitten, and then Merrick, Merrick Butte. This, you know, a lot of people, um, this is actually the, the iconic West. So they usually are okay with just doing a, a sunrise in this area because you get all the lighting and that'll actually reflect off, reflect off against the walls here in the back and everything will just light up. From Monument Valley, we headed to Moab, and now we were deep within Utah, going through more red, red rock landscapes and little towns. The action in Mexican Hat was non-existent. It was a ghost town of abandoned restaurants and motels. But up the road in Bluff, there was a little ice cream store and movie theater. About two hours later, we got to Moab, home of the Arches National Park, and the Delicate Arch Monument. The big question here, when to photograph her, and from what direction? All right, so if you want to hike up to see the Great Delicate Arch in the morning, they tell me here you need to be at the park by 4.30 or 5 a.m. in the morning. And that is if you're there during those five months of the year where it's really, really hot. That would be May through the end of September. The hike up to Delicate Arch is a steep mile and a half. I think that's nothing. The rock itself is like a major natural solar collector. So your head will be about 100 degrees. The rock, well, anywhere from 130 up. 
it gathers it all day long and doesn't release it until around four in the morning, which is a really nice time to go up to Delicate Arch. You'll get your best travel photo of the Delicate Arch in the evening by far. The question is, how do you feel about walking back after sunset in the dark down a trail that can take one hour or longer to complete? Or would you prefer going up there in the morning when it's a lot easier to see? Yeah, but it's a pretty easy walk. I mean, it's pretty easy to find with a flashlight. Take it from local photographer Tom Till. He knows the area backwards and forwards and certainly knows his arch. His classic shot of the arch was featured by the United States Postal Service on a popular stamp, and he got the shot in the evening at sunset. How did it happen? They just called me. They called you and said, hi, this is the United States Postal Service. We'll give you free mail for the rest of your life. No, 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 no. no. They pay you $1,000, which doesn't seem like much, but nobody says no to that. Right. Everybody says yes, so they know that. So they know they can just pay you $1,000. Another photo tip, beyond what time to get your art shot, the next question is also where to stand to get it. Most people go for the opposite side of the basin, which is that iconic postcard shot. And also know there's usually a line to get it, as well as the group shot and selfie under the arch. Yeah, a big trick there when you go is which side to stand on, right? Yeah, yeah. What do you recommend? I... Uh, everywhere. Everywhere. I try everything, everywhere. Yeah. Try it all. A great idea, but please be careful. You are standing on slick rock that's nearly 5,000 feet up in the air. And by the way, if my pictures here look a little unusual, well, of course they are. They were filmed with the crazy Insta360 camera, which has two lenses on it for multiple angles. It can also give you drone-like effects in an area where drones are not allowed, as in a national park. So you want to see what it's like to make the climb up to the arch? Let's go. I brought my trusty drone to Moab and I flew outside the park on a hot July day when the temps topped 100 degrees and I got an error message when the drone was in the air saying it was just too darn hot and it was going to immediately land no matter what I did across the way. Luckily, I retrieved it in the field. I'm with this very wise statement from this blogger who said that even if you live to be a thousand years old, you'll still only get to see a fraction of what Moab and Arches National Park has to offer. Yeah, people just think of the national parks and sometimes they just think of arches. But there's so much more that the Canyonlands is so big and it has so many arches too. When we were in Moab, we were on a schedule. We didn't have time to get to the Dead Horse State Park. We didn't have time to get to Canyonlands. We had to move on to the next stop. But I've got a great solution. I've learned my lesson. I'm going back. So please stay tuned. It's coming soon. Part two, Canyonlands, Dead Horse, and the rest of Moab. From Moab, we had a nearly three hour drive to Glenwood Springs and reached the Colorado border in about an hour. 
I loved standing out there and hitting both states at the same time. There was also some interesting roadside views of a fire down the way. Glenwood Springs is a town that is known for having a huge, fantastic hot spring in the center of town and an old historic hotel, the Hotel Colorado, where the teddy bear was invented, or said to be invented anyway. It was named after President Teddy Roosevelt, who was staying at the hotel, and he was down in the dumps after a bear hunting expedition proved fruitless. A member of the housekeeping staff tried to cheer him up with little bear doll, which she nicknamed Teddy. Like Prescott, Glenwood Springs also takes its Western heritage seriously. It's here where Wyatt Earp's friend Doc Holliday died, not in a gunfight, but an illness, and he's buried in a cemetery in town. There's also a local saloon named in his honor and the best Western shop we saw anywhere on the Strip. Stepping in set me back hundreds of dollars. From Glenwood, next up was Boulder, three hours away, a great college town that easily brings a John Denver song to life. How about that for Rocky Mountain High? They should come visit Boulder uh, because it, it really is, it's an amazing small city. It's got a college, so there's a lot of young people and a lot of energy. Um, and you got great restaurants, and you've also got the beautiful Rocky Mountains right behind you. Well, it's that iconic image of Boulder. It's uh, right out of urban downtown Boulder is this area, Chautauqua Park, and the Flatiron, and it's surrounded by 28,000 acres of open space that's owned by the citizens of Boulder. The Flatirons are, you're not going to find them anywhere but Boulder, and that's what brings a lot of people as well. All right, let's go see Boulder. Now this is a great place to see and photograph on foot, and let's begin with my friend Greg and his four key photo spots to look out for. Postcard number one, uh, Pearl Street. Postcard number two, the Flatirons. Uh, postcard number three, Chautauqua Dining Hall with the music hall behind it, because you kind of get the Flatirons in the background, so you get two for one. One more postcard, Boulder Creek. Get down to Boulder Creek, get a nice, Nice postcard of the creek. You can technically do all of them on foot in under an hour, but to get the best views of town from above, you're gonna need a car. The walking portion, well, here we go, starting on Pearl Street. Everyone who comes to Boulder comes to Pearl. Pearl is very well known. It's all pedestrian, four block. Restaurants, retail stores, vendors, it attracts a lot of people from all over. Photographically, for me, the highlights are the old buildings dating back to the 1860s. Have fun with your smartphone picking up some of the details. Does this great old courthouse, which is on the National Register of Historic Buildings, stand out to you? Because it sure does to me. I love the artwork and I love the fountain. As always, shots taken during the day really pale in comparison to what I was able to get at dusk when they turned the lights on. Meanwhile, don't forget to hit the side streets too. That's where I found the great old Boulder Theater. The artwork there was stunning by day, but again at night with the neon on, a way cooler presentation. Now to get great night shots, put your smartphone camera on the wide 1X lens, which is the sharpest and the best for low light. While downtown, my pal Felix pointed out where to get the best overhead shot of Boulder without using a drone at a restaurant called Avante. They've got like all these like little restaurants inside and uh, there's a super nice rooftop area where you can see the flat irons really well and all of Pearl Street. And uh, like it, the sunsets are really beautiful there. At Avante, I set an iPhone up on the ledge for an extended time lapse and I let it roll for about an hour because that's what you do. When I saw the clouds flying through the sky, I got really excited because they can really make a time lapse sing. Now, before you leave Pearl Street, if you'd like to see a little nostalgia or just want to see some beautiful Victorian homes from another time, well, check out Pine Street. This was the fictional home of TV's Mork and Mindy in the 1970s and 80s. If you don't remember the show, Ask the parents, this is where Robin Williams first found fame. Mm -hmm. 
Now let's head down the street to another one of Greg's favorites, Boulder Creek. Right here in the center of town, across the street from the main library, a river runs through Boulder, and it goes really fast, fast enough for tubing and kayaking. This is also a popular spot for cycling and walking. Finally, let's head over to Chautauqua Park and those miles and miles of hikes. There are the beautiful Flatiron Mountains, the number one symbol of Boulder. They're just flat um, sandstone pieces of rock, and they're cut a certain way where, naturally cut, but um, you're not gonna find it anywhere else. And so there's lots of hikes that go up there. You can climb up on the flat irons and look over the rest of Boulder. It's really awesome. Chautauqua Park. Chautauqua Park is about 15 minutes from Pearl Street. Um, there's a park there, restaurants, hiking, you can picnic, and it's awesome. After the climb, finish up at the Chautauqua Dining Hall, another historic beauty dating back to 1898. Then let's go up the hill about a 15 minute drive. This is where I shot my opening scene for the video and I explored with my pals, Jim and Susan. Thank you for bringing me up here. Totally my Local pleasure. guy, that was the best spots in town. Tell everybody what this spot is. Well, Boulder has a series of ridges over it that collect the morning light and so it's fabulous for photographing then, but sometimes you wanna see the sunset and you have to come up to the top of Flagstaff Mountain, park over there, hike along the ridge, and then dropping off to the west, you have the dramatic view of the divide. It's the special little place. It was an honor to get to bring you here this morning. And what do you like about it up here? Oh my God, what don't I like? The view, the air, the smell, the sound. And if people wanna come, they just go up Baseline Road, which becomes Flagstaff Road, right? So up Flagstaff Mountain, through all the way up to the mountain park at the top, through it to Artist Point. Artist Point, and which the sign has a camera on it, right? Can't, can't argue. Yeah, I can't argue. Mornings are the best time to shoot the, the, uh, the big mountain. Flat irons from down low. Chautauqua is the classic where you were this morning. And then uh, afternoon, it's usually tough, but this is the secret seat. Lastly, I came up with one more great photo spot for a shot of the Flatirons. It was out of town a bit at the local high school of all places in the parking lot. I flew my drone over the lake and got great views of the mountains from here. And just a few miles away from Pearl Street in downtown Boulder, the back streets near the high school brought me down a lonely road past incredibly picturesque farms and vistas that I will never forget. Thank you, Boulder. From Boulder, it was on to Badlands National Park in South Dakota to attend a photo workshop. But first, we embarked on a four and a half hour drive through Nebraska to stay overnight en route to Dakota. For three hours, we drove through eerily quiet roads with no open businesses, just abandoned motels and cafes something that I love to take pictures of. I fell in love with the red roads, something I had never seen before, but learned later that it was a snow thing to make the roads easier to drive on. We don't have those back in California. We saw the first hint of life in Alliance, Nebraska, which was an hour away from Shadron, and we had dinner there at a small hamburger place. In Shadron, I enjoyed photographing the patriotic hay on the side of the road and the 55 mile per hour speed limit signs, a rarity on a trip that was in the 75 to 80 miles per hour range. Two hours later, we're in South Dakota and the otherworldly land of Badlands. behind me, you got George Washington, you got Abe Lincoln, you got Theodore Roosevelt, and of course you have Thomas Jefferson, and right in front, Jefferson Graham, right here, feet in here, Mount Rushmore, South Dakota. You close your eyes, you think South Dakota, that is the most iconic image. It is a great place, it's what brings everybody in. You'll spend about an hour here checking out the grounds, 
Great place to start, but there's so much more to South Dakota. But you know, we do have to begin with the state's number one attraction before we move on. Photographically, you're going to get the same Mount Rushmore shot as everyone else because you really don't have a lot of options. You pull in, you pay $10 to park, you walk the grounds, you catch the exhibit on the building of Rushmore, and then you look up on the deck at the four presidents. No, you cannot be like Cary Grant and Eva Marie Saint and climb to the top like they appear to do at the end of Alfred Hitchcock's classic film, North by Northwest. Now, my photo here is not an illusion, but it's of two workers doing maintenance atop George Washington's head. Sorry, we really aren't invited. But for the cool side angle view... This is really easy. Just drive north about a mile or so, past the parking lot to the lookout, and then look up. For this, I was using the Samsung Galaxy S23 Plus, which has a particularly great zoom lens with a bigger throw than the iPhone. For an alternative view of history, the Crazy Horse Monument is just down the road and is a must-stop. It's the Native American response to sacred land that was taken away from them to make way for Rushmore. Now, the project is a work in progress and is nowhere near completion, but the best parts are the exhibits, which tell you all about the history. It costs around $30 to enter, and while you can't climb to the top here either, an extra five bucks will get you a bus ride to bring you to a closer look. You'll get the same photo of the monument from down here that you can at the Overlook, however. Now, your best South Dakota photo highlights will be in what I think should be the number one attraction in the state, the Badlands National Park. The Badlands, it's hard to describe. I mean, it's... Uh Lots of lots of color, especially early in the day and late in the day. Um, a lot of uh, very sharp features, but what most people don't realize is it's uh, it's not rock like you'd see in say the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's it's more of a uh, a layered dirt with lots of color. Badlands is the 20th most visited national park, but it really should be on your radar. Being here is like visiting another planet with colorful buttes, spires, and pinnacles to explore. Now, why did Badlands get its name? It was it was actually named from the natives, I was just told, because they called it Land Bad. And now it's Badlands. How bad? Well, consider this. What a local told me was, well, would you want to ride a wagon train over those rocks? Okay, people tell me when you come to South Dakota, you know, you got to see Wall Drug. It's an experience. It's a store. It's a town. It's an entire block. And I don't know about photo ops, but it does say right there, bring your camera. So let's go inside and check out Wall Drug and see what it's all about. Come on, let's go. Before she runs me over. Okay, here we go. Wall drug, door number one. Wow, look at this. This is a drugstore? You can smell the letter. How you doing? What's up? Where should we go first? Looks like Doc Holliday. I'm your Huckleberry, my friend. I'm your Huckleberry. Right? Lily Langtree, maybe? Bookshop? Leather goods? I think that's Buffalo Bill. What do you say, Buffalo Bill? They did say to bring your camera, didn't they? Oh, my heck. Now how's that for a keychain? Yes, we are in South Dakota. Mount Rushmore itself. A little Badlands something with a little wall drug sign. Could I get Jeff Street? That's what I want. I want Jeff Street from the Badlands, but it's hard to turn this. What, I, I see Hudson, I see Isaac and Ian and Jacob and Jamie and Julian and Juan and I think in between Jaden and Jenna 
would be the Jeff. And there's no Jeff here. Look what I found here. Jeff, 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 Jeff from Badlands. Here I am, Mount Rushmore. Me and George and Tom and Abe and Teddy. Here comes the Kona. Ruth, you gonna get the Kona? Thank you. Happy, I'd like to thank you for giving me the skinny on how to navigate my way through Wall Drug. It's a town, it's a city, it's a block, it's a million little stores that started as a drug shop and they've got everything. They got ice cream, they got wall art, they got Western wear, they got, um, they got little badges with my name on it. I even got one of those. What the thing that's hard to find though is aspirin and cough syrup, but you do have it. It's hidden, but you do have it. Folks, if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor. Please like, please share, please subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe to Photo Watch TV right here on YouTube. We are on the road right now. We are in the Black Hills of South Dakota having a ball. I hope you stay tuned. we got many more episodes coming up. I look forward to seeing you all on the next Photo Walk. Bye, Pappy. You want to wave? You want to say goodbye? Or you want, just want to like grunt? I heard it. I hope you did, too. Bye, Pappy. Breakfast is served. While in the Badlands, we stayed just down the road at the Circle View Ranch, a really special place that we shared with chickens, horses, mules, a peacock, and several cats that enjoyed walking down the road with us each morning. Here come the chickens. Is that their favorite tree? Mealworms, uh -huh. and they're alive, right? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, they're not. They're dead. Wild, dead worms. Yep, they're dried out. Oh, I see. Breakfast time at the Circle View yeah. Ranch. That's what's on the menu. And let's take a look. We got the biscuits. We got the gravy. We got the sausage. We got the eggs. We got the hash browns. We got the homemade granola. We got some fruit. And how about a nice little smoothie and some orange juice. Just taking the eggs out. Just like home, huh? The ranch itself is on 3,000 acres of land, and the property includes seven homey guest rooms. Logistically, you are about five miles away from the entrance to the Badlands National Park, 30 miles away from Wall Drug, and a 90 minute drive to Mount Rushmore and Crazy Horse Memorial. But once you're on the ranch, who wants to leave, right? <laughs> We'll have more of our South Dakota photo walk in just one second, but first some photo tips. Photo tip number one is to slow down. You've heard me say it many times. You're on a road trip, you're zooming down the road, you're looking out the window. Well, that's cute. And you keep on going. Uh-uh. You see some Texas Longhorn cows, those big, beautiful cows looking you in the face. You want to pull over and you want to get the shot and you want to get it now. In the case of the livestock, you're separated with some electric fence, so there's nothing to worry about. Another thing we saw, we're, we're passing through the little teeny town of Interior, population 94, and we see the city jail. A city jail in a town with 94 people? You gotta be kidding. Pull over, get some shots. This is one of my favorite photo ops of the entire trip. Now the Badlands. The Badlands are amazing, and uh, again, timing is everything here. Timing, timing, timing. During the day, these badlands look hazy and yucky. During the morning and the evening, shadows, color, shade. I mean, it was amazing. It, what a difference. So it really paid off going there early. I shot all these in color, obviously, in digital, but I converted most of them to black and white because they just seemed more dramatic. I did the conversion in Adobe Lightroom, which is a subscription program that sells for $9.99 monthly and is worth every penny. As I noted, we went to South Dakota to attend a photo workshop on shooting the night skies with a mobile phone. So how do we do it? It's pretty simple. Night mode on the iPhone, expert raw on the Samsung Galaxy. Now the Samsung Galaxy later phones from the S20 on up have an add-on app called expert raw and when you open that app up you get to keep the shutter open for a longer period 
my picture of the fire station with the Milky Way in the background was taken at 20 seconds. My wife Ruth took her picture on the iPhone in night mode, which is this automatic feature that just goes on when Apple decides that it is truly dark and you need the extra help. The good news is you can adjust the settings and keep the shutter open for seemingly as long as 30 seconds. And that's what you need to capture the stars in the background and the whole scene. Uh, my friend Barb did this wonderful, wonderful star trail shot using the third party app called Even Longer. And she was able to keep the shutter open for as long as a full hour, taking one picture every 15 seconds. And that's how she got the effect. Uh, do know that tripods are mandatory. You cannot get pictures like this without a tripod. Yes, you got to have it on a tripod. You walk up almost in total dark, set up your camera, um, get into your even longer app, set up your the time, and then you set the increments. And then the even longer app does the work for you on figuring it. And you keep your lights off and you hit the hit the shutter button, and you walk away for one hour. Also remember, you kind of need a dark sky. You won't find that everywhere. We were in a remote area of South Dakota that has particularly dark skies. Having lights on would have ruined the image. So places uh, like Joshua Tree, the Badlands of South Dakota, uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, these are great places with wonderful skies, That New Mexico as well. Give it a try. It's a pretty simple thing to do as, well, as long as you're willing to have a tripod and do lots of trial and error. We took these pictures around between 10 p.m. and midnight. So you need to, to put in the time. Uh, as we get to the winter months, you can do it earlier because it'll be dark earlier. Yeah, mobile phones. It's really interesting. I was out just shooting in uh, Utah uh, with, a, with uh, somebody at a conference and they had a, a Z9, you know, one of the best cameras out there to shoot a night photography. And uh, we're doing low level light painting. We're lighting up the subject and uh, it was looking really great on the Z9. But I, I had showed them they had a Samsung S23 and I busted out mine and showed them the astrophotography mode. They'd never seen it before where it tracks the sky over four minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes. And uh, it was funny because they ended up uh, taking the rest of the night and putting down their Z9 and shooting with their Samsung. Down on the ground, the other can't miss South Dakota visit is Deadwood, an old Western town that began booming in the 1860s with gamblers, ramblers, prostitutes, and the like. Now the Old West is still alive and well in a theme park-like setting that's mostly chock full of casinos and kids shops. Deadwood is a fun visit, but you know, I preferred the more authentic Custer. It's more real, and here you are surrounded by nearby scenic beauty of the Black Hills like the Sylvan River, Needles Highway, and the Wildlife Loop. This is where I found that bison taking a leisurely walk down the road. How cool is that? I love the wildlife, um, the scenery. It's just, it's never ending beauty. It's just, I, I can't get enough of it. <laughs> From South Dakota, it was on to Wyoming. We drove approximately nine hours through rural parts of the state to get to Jackson Hole on the southwestern tip of Wyoming, which is right near the Idaho border. Along the way, we found some really great, lonely country roads. Went in Jackson Hole, two major selfie spots. One is the Antlers, right across the street in the town square. And there's four of them. Everybody wants to pose in front of there. Then you got the Million Dollar Cowboy Bar. Willie and Whalen played here and so many other people. I want to show it to you. Come on in. Check it out. How many bars do you know where you can sit on a saddle? I could sit this way and I could order a drink. Feel like a real cowboy when I'm doing this. We're going to go over the specific locations for my photo pics in a minute, but first some logistics. As always, I documented the journey with mobile phones, the iPhone, the Galaxy S23, and the GoPro Hero 11. 
Without a big camera and zoom lens, I couldn't get as close to the wildlife, but you know, the wide shots look pretty great. With your smartphone, you're not gonna have that that zoom or reach, but if you if you want a, a shot that incorporates uh, a little bit more of the landscape and the story of, of the environment where the animal lives, you, you can do some work Uh, some good work with the smartphone. Now about Jackson, it's on the western tip of Wyoming, just west of the Idaho border and south of Montana. It's just about 10 minutes from Grand Teton National Park and 40 minute drive from Yellowstone, putting it right near two of the most popular parks in the world, which together attract over 6 million yearly visitors. What makes it such a photo magnet? We've got um, dramatic skies and clouds, and we've kind of got it all. And in addition to that, just exceptional wildlife outside of um, Alaska or Africa, um, really um, some of the most diverse wildlife you can find. As for timing, mornings are your best time to photograph the Tetons when the sun is beating down on them. In the afternoon, the Tetons are shaded. Do know that Jackson is a very expensive place to stay and many people will go over the mountain pass to Victor and the Teton Valley where roommates can be as much as 25% of what you would have to pay in Jackson. Plus, you get to see the other side of the Tetons and some amazing skies, so stay tuned. I will show you Victor in part two of this episode. Meanwhile, those five photo spots. Many locals will tell you about various great places to catch the moose, but this spot in the park really worked well for us. Schwabacher's Landing is the name of the little waterfront lake where the moose like to visit in the early morning and sunset. You can tell that we weren't the only ones to figure this out. I use the Galaxy for most of my shots here as it has a stronger zoom than the iPhone 14, getting me way closer to the subject. Photo tips, be quiet and snap a lot, please. In the case of wildlife, you're looking at luck. Just frame your shot accordingly and hope for the best. You could also try burst mode if the animal is moving fast, but in this case, the moose was pretty content just drinking water and eating grass. Jenny Lake is a fun visit, not just for photos, but also grabbing a boat ride out where we were warned we might see some bears. We didn't, but it was fun anyways. My favorite part beyond that amazing waterfall was just getting shots of the Tetons directly from the overlook by the boat landing and stepping down into the sand to get around the shrubbery for my view. Here I used the Galaxy for a close-up of the Tetons and ran the iPhone 14 as a time-lapse because I love the idea of watching the clouds zoom over the mountains. Mormon Row, a collection of old barns belonging to members of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, dates back to the 1890s and they still look absolutely majestic today. Photo tip, if you have a camera with a big zoom lens or just want to go to telephoto on your smartphone, it will make the mountains seem closer than they are and you'll have fun with your shot. One of the most famous photos from the great late photographer Ansel Adams was called the Tetons and the Snake River and it's so popular that park officials have a turnoff right on Highway 191 about 90 minutes south of Yellowstone en route to Jackson for all to see. However, the photo that he did pick up in 1942 from atop his car, well, that view looks quite different today with so many trees that have blocked the view, but it's still a stunner and worth stopping for. Now, I showed you my two photo highlights of downtown Jackson. Again, very pricey for overnight stays with rates in the three to four to $500 range and up in the summer, but a fun place to walk around. The Bunnery has a great huckleberry pie and Moo's Ice Cream is an incredibly popular ice creamery. I got a really nice overhead shot at downtown Jackson from the deck at the Roadhouse Brewing Company. Now let's head over the mountain pass with a 40 minute drive from Jackson to the Teton Valley, where the wealth of being so close to the national parks is but a distant memory. Not only are things way cheaper here in the action less intense, but you get an added bonus, a different look at the Tetons from the other side. 
It was here in Victor where I picked up some of the most dramatic skies and time lapses of the trip, saw rainbows, and yeah, I had the best huckleberry milkshake of my life. The Teton Valley is primarily three little cities, Victor and Drake's, which each have about 2,000 people living there, and tiny Tetonia with 300 folks. This is a great area for taking a country drive, biking and hiking, shooting landscapes and time lapses on your smartphone, and just having fun walking around. You'll see acres and acres of farmland, complete with working farms, and even abandoned ones. We pulled over because I couldn't believe somebody wanted to walk away from this butte. Would you look at that view? Who would want to give that up? The Idaho border is so close to Wyoming that even on this little country road in Tetonia, we were just a few blocks off main highway of Route 33, and we ended up in Wyoming again without having to go over a mountain pass. How do you like that little welcome to Wyoming sign? Now about those great skies, I don't know why they were so dramatic here, but every night was an award winner, from the rainbow and dregs to the time lapses, sunrise and sunsets at the side of the road. I love the self-portrait I did one morning just before the rain was about to hit in Victor. Where I was standing, it was dry, but in the background, you can see the skies start to swell. Food-wise, there is a little supper club in town called the Naughty Pine that serves one mean barbecue. Brakeman's has won raves for its burgers and Idaho cut fries, and the Little Butter Cafe is a cute little place with fantastic cornbread muffins. And did I happen to mention this great little eatery at the corner of Main Street and Depot Way? It's been said, inside these doors, the Emporium in Victor, Idaho, greatest huckleberry milkshake in the world. For real? Come on inside and let's find out. And no, hello, hello. Come on in, let's go back to the counter. How you doing? Can I get a name without ordering? Jeff, but we won't be very far from you. We hear the, the best shakes in the world, the Huckleberry Shake. World famous. You've had people from all over the world here, right? Yeah, and now we're here from California. Awesome. So you're gonna make our shake for us? Yep. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. All of our milkshakes are ice cream vanilla based, so we put okay. ice cream, vanilla ice cream, and then we just add everything. So we just add huckleberries, and then we do two scoops of juice. So it's purple. So these are more tart. Blueberries are more, for say, sweet and blue. Huckleberries are more tart and um, homegrown here. So, because blueberries, if you made a milkshake out of it, I would say it'd be like blue, dark kind of. Um, yeah. Blueberries, purple, always purple. Here comes another classic Sorry. huckleberry Sorry. shake. That's okay. Look at that. That looks beautiful. All right. And look what we have a huckleberry milkshake. Let's give it a taste. Really good. After the Teton Valley, it was time for another four and a half hours on the road, heading south to Park City, Utah, a mountain town best known for skiing that also, like Jackson, happens to come alive in the summer, just not as high as Jackson. In Park City, the downtown on Main Street is a really fun walk and all those great trails for hikes and bikes all over. But photographically, we fell in love with the old vintage farm on the side of the road. This is said to be the most photographed in Utah. Is this iconic or what? Speaking of the side of the road, love these cows in nearby Heber stepping into the water for a little summer dip and maybe a sip as well. 
After Park City, we headed down Route 15 South, Utah, for one last overnight stay in Henderson, Nevada, where we visited my all-time favorite restaurant in the world, Juan's Flaming Fajitas. Catch it in slow-mo beauty here. Yep, shot on an iPhone. The next morning, it was back to Route 15 South to head to the California border. One last pose in the desert with my Western garb because why not? All right, everybody, we made it to California to the conclusion of the big Photo Watch 23 tour. Nine states, California, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, South Dakota. Have I missed anything? So uh, thanks everyone for joining us on this little trip. It's been the trip of a lifetime.